talk about the particularities of this story of religion. Okay. This is the outline that Pope Benedict gives in his book on truth and tolerance. And I think it allows us a, if you will, a hermeneutic, a way of reading the religious traditions that we will be engaging. And with a sensitivity when we teach it to what is really at issue in the particularity of that religion and religious form, and also, therefore, what we are in called as Christians to engage and highlight. All right? So, essentially, I don't know if you can see that all that well, this says primitive experience moving into mythical religions and then three ways of moving beyond the myth. Mysticism, the monotheistic revolution, and enlightenment. The first step of this process is to large-scale myth. Now, working with such great people as Mircea Eliade, van der Leo, uh, uh, stu students of religious phenomenology, Okay, people who study anthropologically and sociologically what's going on. There, there, you can trace that historically there was a moment when someone moved from, don't go near that tree out there. It's charged with danger. And everyone in the village, there's the tree of danger. And on the other side, that that tree over there always gives us, you know, if you eat from it, it gives us like maybe something good. And I buried my grandfather there and the spirits are there. So you have stories, particular stories, and encountering the world in those particular ways, moving from that to crafting a larger narrative, a larger myth. Now the word myth here does not mean a lie. Someone defined myth as the way we used to speak before we learned how to lie. It's truth-telling in a different way, in a storied way. And a myth is the kind of a story that allows one to make sense of the world, to put it all together. There are two, like, I mean, there are many kinds of story, story forms. The complete opposite of myth would probably be parable. Because a parable is the kind of a story that fractures your understanding of how the world works and throws everything up into question. I'm 50 years old, I'm just getting ready to move into my fullness of life and strength, and I've got cancer, and I'm gonna be dead in six months. That's a parable. Ripped open is a gap in the story that allows our world to be comfortable. And how we dwell in it changes us. Christianity brings those two together. Christ Jesus, the Word who made the world, is also the parable who opens up for us a new way of encountering that through the, par the parable of the cross, through his own parables, through the very parable that God became flesh in a particular human being at a particular point in human history in a way that has never happened and before or since. That's a parable. Remember? Foolishness. To the Greeks, a stumbling block to the Jews. And you have to rethink. So, and to both kinds of stories, people need both. You need, the, you need the myth that helps the world make sense. You need to read the Lord of the Rings. Right? The Lord of the Rings is an attempt at mythology. It tells the truth. That book is so powerful because it's profoundly and utterly true. It's an act of co-creation with God. That world is a true world. All right? And yet, at the same time, you need parable stories that open up and shatter the kind of comfort that allow us to become intolerant in which the myth rolls over the world. And the, the reality is, is that it's not about a story. It's about a person. Christianity is not a story. Christianity is an encounter with a person. It's his life that continues. And from that comes the story. And then from that comes the way of living. 
The Word becomes flesh. The story becomes flesh, and we live in that. And of its beauty we have seen. The glory is of the only child of God. So, the first step that happened in history was people moving to a large-scale myth. We probably have access to this. It would be interesting if you look at, although it's still quite a far way behind us, between, like, I read the Book of Dene, for example, which is a marvelous book written, of course, by, as most of, most of the writings of our First Nation peoples were all done by priests and uh, who recorded it because there's, there, our culture is a written culture and what loses in a written culture is an oral culture because if you forget the story, the story dies. We write the story so that the story is kept. And so one of the first impulses of some, not all, of the missionaries was to write the stories. But of course, when they wrote the stories, they also infused it, remember? Because First Nation spirituality is always absorbing, new, ever new, always developing. And so there's a lot of Christianity in it. Why? Because First Nation people met Christians. And some are Christians, you know? So that's a, an ongoing kind of flow. But you can see there the, way, the move in some of those stories, structurally, the move from a particular story to a larger myth. Okay. But that really doesn't make much difference for us now. Because what applies to us is this great movement that moved beyond the myth, the myth of gods and the multiple stories of their, of their interacting with the world that explained it, to the three kind of religious forms that in the main we are confronted with in the world and in which religions take their shape. The first movement beyond the myth we find in the Asian religions, in the main. Religions that we now identify as Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. I will not say Sikhism here, because Sikhism is a later, you have to respect the particularity of it, it's a 17th century uh, reality that emerged from the intersection of Hinduism of the northern form, of the certain Vedic Hinduism, and Islam with some Christian interpolations. And I also don't include Taoism and Confucianism and Shintoism in this because those, well I do and I don't, you have to, because they are, they are what it means to call them a religion is a bit of a challenge. Because they are not necessary. Confucianism, for example, doesn't have a transcendental referent. Okay? It doesn't have the sense about there being something beyond. It's a great way, a philosophy of how to live respecting the tradition of the sage here. Okay? So, in mysticism, the thing about it is, is that the myth... In mysticism, what is focused upon is the absolute value of religious experience. The focus in mysticism is the experience that, an, that a believer has in being caught up in, in a way that they can taste into the ultimate truth. The focus is an experience that the believer can achieve by following certain practices. Okay? Whether they be ritual, whether they be uh, creedal, or whether they be in a form of meditational practice, the focus is on the human person's experience. And might I further say that it is the experience of unity, of complete and utter oneness. Now before we leap and say, hey, that sounds just like us, let's just pause and not go there. Let's allow this to unfold a little bit more. The myths are preserved as symbols 
of an unnameable reality. Hinduism, if it is anything, is monotheistic in the sense that there is a deep idea that there is only one God. So, when you open your book and you see on page 245 and 246 the presentation in God, God forms, in card forms, of the various avatars of the divinity, what you see before you is, if you will, the preservation of the myth. There are a million gods in Hinduism, but there is only one god. These are all avatars, expressions, incarnations, yes, but not in the sense of us having an incarnation. There's no definitive incarnation of the reality of God, which is experienced as creating, preserving, and destroying, Vishnu, a Brahman, Vishnu, and Shiva, the trilogy, the, tri the trilogy of the story, and the various avatars of those various expressions. And yet the truth of Hinduism, at least in its Vedic sense, is tam tvam etsi svatateku. Svetateku, that thou art. As the water flows into the river, how can you tell which is part of the river and which is uh, which this river flows into the ocean? How can you tell which is part of the river and which is part of the ocean? That fineness, that thou art. Because the reality, of course, for you and I, for in a sense, for a profoundly reflective Hindu, of course, there's many Hinduisms, is that the Brahman, the mystery of the divine, and the Atman, the mystery of the human soul or the world soul, is that the Brahman is the Atman. It is only illusion that you think you are not me. Because profoundly and utterly we are one, because that's the truth. This is simply illusion. And the journey is to free oneself of that illusion. So therefore you can have myths, because it's all illusion. Now, I'm pushing this philosophically. But I think structurally it allows the great play of Ganesh, the great, I don't know, the, I, I'm not a Hindu scholar, so I can't go into talk about the, the, the derivation of the, of the myth that became part of Ganesh as the, I think he's one of the avatars of Vishnu, isn't he? And so, that these, these are preserved. It's all symbolic. So, for example, when it comes to Christ, they have no problem with Christ as a consciousness, as a teacher, maybe not so much an avatar. I think there's a, they wouldn't jump at seeing G Jesus as an avatar, but they certainly would say Christ manifests a kind of a consciousness. The stumbling block for the Hindu is any kind of particularity the absolute value of the unnameable experience. Mysticism, and we have in our own mystical tradition, always and everywhere talks about the encounter with the ineffable. That as soon as you start talking about it, you t it goes away from you, it recedes. The experience of oneness is so beyond the power of words that words fail. That's of central concern. Interestingly in this, God is entirely passive. The mystery of the ineffable experience is passive. There are avatars. But even think of the great Bhagavad Gita, which is an absolutely beautiful work, where the fundamental structure, and this Iliad, it's at this sort of like uh, uh, Iliad moment, you know, when uh, Arjuna is standing there crushed by depression because there before him are all of his uncles and cousins and he's got to go and kill them. And he says, I can't kill them. And the Lord Krishna has become, as an avatar, his, his charioteer and says, what do you mean you can't kill them? To kill them or not to kill them, it's all the same. Right? This is all just illusion. This is passivity. So be the good I'm, I'm summarizing, which is an amazingly powerful, beautiful thing. Be the good that you find yourself given to be. Be a good warrior. And kill because it's only an illusion. The illusion that you and they are different. But you see in that, 
It's an invitation to complete passivity, in a sense. The surrender, which, of course, Buddha will bring up into an even deeper, more profound way of, li of living, when he awakens to the fact that there is no thing. He awakened to the, the truth. He was enlightened that there is nothing. So the God encountered in Eastern religious forms is passive. Here's the difference. If you say to a kid, kneel down, read this prayer, and you will meet God. You will have lied to them. Because all of our mystical practices, all of our prayer practices, are only and everywhere an invitation to dispose ourselves to God who is active. And the freedom of God to respond or not. Think of Mother Teresa, who sat for hours every day doing the discipline <laughs> and never experienced God except the experience of God's absence. Okay? There is a profound confidence in the East. Say, for example, those who follow the Raja Yoga, the Royal Yoga, if you practice it, it will come. Because it's your doing. Because it's not really your doing. Because there's no doing. It's your surrendering to the ultimate non-doing, which is the divine. And it will come. So there's a confidence. Here is the practice. I will give you the practice that will allow you to achieve unity. Active self-discovery as identity with being. That means that the human person goes through this, I mean, it's taking, in an isolated sense, the Augustine's injunction, you know, said in te, non, non, non redire, said in te ipsa, non ire, said in te ipsum redire. Don't go outside of yourself, go into yourself. Discover there the truth, which is true. And you have to, but it's only when you receive it from outside. But here, the sense is it's all about self-discovery at its profound level. Okay? There's lots of other ritual sort of things that go on. A lot of people would delay this kind of development, saying, okay, next time around, in my next reincarnation, then I will achieve that sort of life of, of following this. Right now I follow a ritual sort of pattern that leads me. But this also might lead me into the kind of unity that comes from escaping the cycle. We all know this. But the dis you discover, you discover that you and being are one and the same. The truth is, you are God. Whatever God might mean, you are that. And you discover it. It's completely ahistorical. It's cyclic. There is a truth outside of all ages because movement in the world is itself illusory. That there is history is an illusion. You can see, generated on the Indus bank, where you live a cyclic culture, that this becomes established. There is no history. There is simply the cycle. The heart is the same in all ages. The focus here is on eternity. This world, and living for this world, the perennial philosophy that is wedded to, as the Aryan invasion came in with their sense and the richness of their multiple gods and divi divinities, I mean, meeting the multiple gods and divinities of the Indus Valley with the perennial philosophy giving birth to the Vedic kind of expressions, there is a sense that our focus is always and utterly on eternity, such that as Arjuna is explained to by Krishna, this is all illusion. In the face of eternity, what is killing your uncle? Now, a Christian would say a little bit different. Why? This pushes all the right buttons for all real reasons. Number one, experience. And we know how important, if you read the general instruction on, catech on catechetics, there is a profound focus on experience. Because God has come into the world in order for us to experience. You know? To have an, a fleshed encounter. The importance is our attractiveness. It's one thing to say Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. 
The other thing is to allow that experience to become present to people by celebrating the Eucharist in such a way that people can encounter that, they can be disposed to that. Hence, though the liturgists who were all essentially Gnostics in the 60s and 70s, whose brains would blow up nowadays with, oh my goodness, the return of benediction. Everything we've worked for is done. Benediction. Ah! But it's the action of the people. That Jesus is there for eating. Yeah, all that stuff I thought. Yeah, yeah, good. That's true. But, and. There's always and. See, we always either or. I've been at so many talks with people, and like someone said, Jesus, you know, Jesus isn't in the time. Jesus is in us first. It's not either or, it's in both. And you don't get a sense of Jesus being in us by putting the tabernacle in the broom closet at the back. Because what you're teaching people is you're the kind of person in your presence that can be put in a broom closet at the back. If you have neither, do you have Jesus is only in the tabernacle such that you genuflect before uh, the tabernacle, uh, tabernacle and then swat the person next to you and yell at them, you know? That's the incongruity. So we worked off of that incongruity. Now we're working off, we got a whole generation, you know, people said, well, we were told to be quiet and we couldn't talk in church and Jesus would, le petit Jésus va tu panir. I remember this little, very, very little French couple of, uh, of old uh, women who never quite got married. And th this couple that had come back at uh, one of my parishes from a marriage encounter weekend. And one of the things they'd learned at marriage encounter was to hold hands, you know? And, uh, and, and so during the, during the Eucharistic celebration, when it came for the sign of peace, they started kissing each other. And one of the French women said, Pourquoi vous vous baissez comme ça, comme des singes devant le Saint Sacrament? Why are you kissing each other like monkeys in front of the Blessed Sacrament? Okay, that's an extreme. So is the other extreme. Was, oh, you can't have any, like that sort of stuff is like, oh, let's put Jesus in the back so everyone can focus and get rid of all of the statues and make the churches completely unchild friendly. The problem was, as the Pope said, in our celebrations, the Eucharist has become a place of us looking at each other. And we go away and say, there weren't enough women on the altar. There weren't enough the priest wasn't properly genuflected to there. And you wonder, who are we worshiping? We're there to worship God in his sacral presence. What am I talking about? All of this music, we're going, we're, all of the music and stuff, these are wonderful developments that lead us to a new way of tasting God's presence. But the focus is on the transcendent. I have, you know, I do not think that, I mean, one of the great gifts was the translation of the Eucharist into English, the Eucharistic prayer. It was a great gift. And I met that again on Friday when I was celebrating Mass with a bunch of people who hadn't been to church for a long time. And though I love the cadence of the, the Latin Mass, because I know Latin, and it speaks and unfolds things for me, for them, they don't know it. And the Word is saying, don't touch there in that sense. Now, I do think that, the Eucharist, that, the, that our responses and stuff in Latin are beautiful. But the, the thing is, is it makes us accessible and should lead us to something holy. I had a young man who comes to me, and, he, and, he said, and he's going to the Latin Mass. And I said to him, why are you going to He said, I need some transcendence, Father. You know, that the, there's a banalization of our liturgy and of our prayer experiences. We have to talk all the time without this sense of mystery. And to meet Christ Jesus in the Eucharistic adoration, to sing Taizé hymns, and to be led in that is absolutely beautiful because it lifts us up and allows us to taste the Eucharist. The problem is whenever we go around saying or, and, or, and, Stick the choir in the back, keep them at the front. Both depends on the place. You know? I'd, I really think you should, the best thing would be to have the priest never have to look at his face. Because it's so distracting to have to look at my face. I mean, people shine so beautifully. <laughs> no, no. This shines even more beautifully. <laughs> the point being, first of all, experience. 
People are looking for experience. And when you go to a yoga class, you get an experience. And it responds to that. And so our call is, why are we not focusing upon creating places of experience? Focusing on experience in such a way that it comes from the one experience that is lacking in the modern world, which is silence. We don't know what to do or how to do silence. My brother's a religion teacher, and one of the things, and now he's a grade A teacher, and now one of the things he does is he trains his students in being silent. And it starts at the beginning of the year by get, letting them teach, know and learn silence for two minutes. And by the end of the year, they know ten minutes of silence. As he said to me, he knew that it connected when he was up north working with First Nations people in the Maine at St. Mary's School. And they'd gone on a field trip. And he said, there was, the bus hadn't arrived, and so he waited for the bus to come. He said, go and do your own thing. And instead of going to talk to each other, they all went and were quiet. Because silence is a human need. And we don't have it. Pope Benedict is calling for deliberate silence in our Eucharistic gatherings. Deliberate silence. Not the silence of, oh my gosh, is someone supposed to do something? Someone's, you know, when, oh, someone's, where's the person supposed to do X, Y? But being silent. Okay. And that's what's spoken of here. The danger here. I think comes in this, the passivity of God and active self-discovery. This plays into the worst part of our culture. Like someone like, oh, what's his name? Um, the guy who stole the name of the great Catholic uh, mystic, Meister Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle. Is a very attractive thing because it brings this thing, you are God. Well, look at in an individualistic world, what better kind of word can you give to someone than, you know what, you are God. The divine is within you. Namaste, the God in me salutes the God in you and you are God. And actually, it's the same God that's saluting each other in the namaste, which is beautiful. But you see, it fits right into human egotism. And this is the problem of the modern age, is that it's not that God does, doesn't exist, is that God is a function of my needs and wants. God is at my beck and call. God is at my description. God is at my wrestling. And this is the profound difficulty. When you bring this mysticism to the West without bringing the culture of India, the particularity, it becomes, you don't get Hindu, you get North American Hindus. If the first encounter of mysticism that our children have is when they're doing world religions and doing Hinduism, if our teachers are encountering mysticism through Eckhart Tolle, we have greater teachers. We have Joan of... Eckhart Tolle is not the mystic of the church of this age. Why not? Why aren't we reading... Why aren't we reading Teresa of Avila? Therese of Lisieux. Therese of Lisieux, so accessible. You know, John of the Cross, his wonderful poem that unites the Eros and the Agapic in an amazing kind of way. Adrian von Speyer, Elizabeth of the Trinity. Why don't we do this? Because most of the mystics that we have access to, Joan, uh, Dame Julian, are women. And it's the really the rediscovery of the, of the mystical tradition that has been primarily articulated and preserved through women, not only. Dionysius, the Areopagite, pseudo-Dionysius. And then the great mystics, like Thomas Aquinas, Augustine. Why aren't we reading, why, why are people, you know, like this is, we have to ask this question. Why are we not reading the, uh, you know, the Confessions? Which are an amazing book, if you actually bother to read it. And much better written. <laughs> and good translations. Okay. But you see, we come back 
through the gift now that has been given to us in our encounter with the world religions of the East is that it recalls us to our essential tradition. But with a very clear understanding that there are differences. And one of the differences is that we attend to our bodies. And our bodies are saying, let me go and have a break and have some coffee and take the time. And so that's what we do right now. 